Hey y'all, how are you doing? I'm great, thank you so much for asking. It's me, Kim, and I'm back for another video. Yes, the location has changed. We are out of the living room and into the bedroom for the time being. I'm staying at a little interim place while I move. I don't have lights up or anything, but I could not wait to get this conversation out, you guys. This is a discussion with Dr. Brittany Cooper. Let me just tell you, there are about five women in the academy who I truly and genuinely stan. Dr. Cooper is on that list easily. Read everything she writes. Listen anytime she speaks. She is so thoughtful and clear. She has a way of communicating that is just, it's impeccable. It is so, so impressive. So we got together to talk about Say Her Name and the ways that black women and girls are often erased from our conversations about police violence and police brutality. We also talked about having a, a much larger conception of what state violence actually is. And we tried to tackle the very controversial topic of what happens to black women and black girls if we choose to defund the police? Where do their abusers and rapists go if we choose to divest from prisons? We didn't quite agree on that, but like I said, I appreciate her so much for engaging in this conversation. And let me tell you, when I watched back this interview, I was so ashamed because I was just a stumbling and a fumbling over my words. I couldn't get it out because I was nervous. I was so nervous and excited to talk to her. I just couldn't contain it. I don't know what came over me, so sorry. But she more than makes up for it, you guys. It, it was just amazing. You know, one of the best parts of having this job is being able to be consistently in conversation with women like Brittany Cooper, Derricka Purnell, Charlene Carruthers. It makes it all worth it. So here's a conversation. First of all, <laughs> Thank you so much for taking some time. I appreciate yeah. it. I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan. I, I'm obsessed with you. I mean, what you talking about? The fandom is mutual, girl. I'm so, you know, <laughs> been a fan of your work for a long time. Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and get into it. I wanted to talk to you because of the consistent erasure of the lives and the suffering of black women and black girls when we're talking about state violence. But also I have some other stuff that we're, we're gonna get into. So something that I found really fascinating is the way that patriarchy always finds an excuse, much in, the, in much the same way that white supremacy always finds an excuse. So currently the excuse for why the deaths of black women have not compelled the masses to action people are saying it's because we saw George Floyd's murder on video and we didn't see Breonna Taylor. So that explains it all. Do you think that was the reason? <laughs> That's never the reason, right? We also didn't see Trayvon Martin get murdered. We also didn't see Michael Brown get murdered. Um, video is not the, the critical lever that moves us. We have a story in our minds about lynching, right? Where we under, so immediately when we hear about these black men being killed, that story that, you know, um, one of my good friends says our memory is longer than our lifespan. And so we have a, a, a ancestral memory of our folks being hunted down, being, you know, hung from trees. Um, and we think about men as the people to whom that happened. We forget conveniently that it also happened to women and children. They don't fit into that lynching narrative. And so, uh, the other thing about it is that with the George Floyd situation, folks saw the cops sort of, you know, accost him, humiliate him, put their knee on the neck. With the with Breonna Taylor, because the cops were serving supposedly a legal procedure or warrant, they don't. It doesn't fit the story of her being targeted. Like no one thinks the cops showed up to kill her. They think rather more passively that she ended up dead. And while that's enraging. And while that's concerning, they that qualitatively feels less urgent to our people than a system in which the police target and deliberately humiliate Black men. But my question becomes, is it qualitatively different if both Black folks end up dead at the end of the story, right? Right, 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 you know? right, 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 <laughs> right. Um, and so I understand what happens when you inconvenience people's narratives. And when you say, hey, Black women and Black girls matter, I understand that you will often be called divisive. I understand that you will often be called self-serving. 
And so what's your response to being say to people saying that you're just being an agitator, that you're being divisive? Yeah, look, I mean, hey, I say the same thing to them that I say to white people who say this, right? Which is that those of us who point out the division, who point out the sexism, the patriarchy, the differential treatment, the sidelining of black women, we aren't the ones being divisive. It is those folks who think that to be black is only to be a cisgender black male. They have lopped off everybody else who is black and said that they don't matter i don't understand why that's not considered a politics of division and subtraction right um you know i also think that what they're really saying they're not even really saying we're being divisive they're saying that to have to think about black women is a distraction from black politics that we getting on somebody's nerves right how dare you make me think about your needs and your concerns right uh it's super it's super infuriating because when you think about the way that black women love and care for black people, we have a hyper vigilance that is the opposite of distraction. We can never get distracted as black women about black politics. We always have to be super tuned in because at any moment in time, our people get snatched away, they get harmed. And so it is deeply insulting to then be told that the response to our hypervigilance about making sure everyone in the community is included is that for anybody to think about us at all is to be distracted from the larger issue. Right. Do you foresee a time when Black women and Black girls are not an afterthought? That when we say the word Black, that we don't automatically assume man? So, you know, what I want to say is in this moment, um, you know, there has been a lot of organizing on the ground for Breonna Taylor, a lot of local activists who have taken up her story. And I don't want to erase their work or their commitment to sh trying and working to shift this narrative. Um, I think that Kimberly Crenshaw has been a champion for the better part of 30 years of shifting this narrative, both in the creation of the term and framework intersectionality, and then in the creation of the Say Her Name campaign, which then gets taken up by the Black Youth Project in 2015. So the the fact that there are conversations of that type that are part of mainstream Black politics that you can go to a protest and you will see folks saying, say her name, right, um, and protests all across the country says to me that the narrative is shifting. We're not there yet. We're far from there. We're not there yet until, you know, when... You know, folks also said to me, for instance, that we couldn't focus on Breonna Taylor because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Newsflash, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. And... So what we're trying to change is universes of possibility. So in a world where George Floyd is murdered, Black folks are like, I will not be held back from saying something because of a pandemic. Whereas when Breonna Taylor gets killed, folks are like, we can't say nothing because of a pandemic, right? That's the fundamental difference that we're talking about. So I'm actually not, and, and I think it bothers some people, but I'm actually not impressed by the fact even though I'm thankful that there's a movement to get justice for Brianna, I'm very angry that it took the killing of a Black man before people could even focus in and think about that case, right? Because here's the thing that we're also saying. Imagine if we as a nation had been outraged in March about the killing of Brianna. That might have put the police on notice and so George Floyd might be alive. That's the hard part, right? Is that when we don't, when we miss Black women, that also endangers the community. Every Black person that we miss and that we don't have an uprising for means that there's more of a possibility of another Black person getting killed. And so if we had figured out a way to have an uprising, then we might have less Black folks in that interim period who had been killed. And that means that we have to begin to see that Black women actually matter for Black politics, that they aren't the addendum, that what we keep learning is that a world that does not listen to Black women, how we vote, and the things that happen to us creates a context for more destruction for all of us, right? Yes, yes. Uh Yes, I think it is so important for us to understand Black women and Black girls as more than collateral damage. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I guess my next thing I wanted to ask is, I am outraged about the erasure. I am angry about the erasure, but also I'm deeply hurt by it. It hurts yeah. my feelings. It hurts my yeah. feelings to feel like an afterthought. And I'm yeah. wondering if you find it to be hurtful. Yeah, 
always, right? Um, look, I've had Black men get downright violent with me when I have demanded that their racial justice politic be gender inclusive. I had a brother years ago to throw water on me at a panel when I said, like, I love your, you know, Black freedom, Black power, but like, where do Black women fit? And so Black men have a deep fragility about this. I understand that that fragility comes from a certain level of vulnerability, a certain level of being exposed all the time. And I even understand that in a world where you feel like you are always watching your back and no interaction is safe and anything could just turn into the terror dome when you walk out the door, when you are in straight survival mode, you don't feel like you have the emotional capacity to look after and think about other people. But Black women don't have the luxury of that, right? We don't. We have to both hold our trauma and our hypervigilance, which is why, you know, we have the health challenges that we have now because we're always holding in our physical bodies both a, a, a hyper-awareness of the environment and a deep need to be empathetic. And so, yeah, I'm hurt. Yeah, I'm hurt that brothers don't ever have to do the emotional work or labor of showing up for us. Don't ever think to themselves that they should organize a protest on our behalf, that they should handle all of the logistics, the getting people in the street, the making sure that folks are taken care of, that they always, that, that their expectation is that we will show up for them and that they don't owe us any reciprocity, right? The, the sort of active erasure. Because the thing I know about that is that's not just a problem for Black politics. That's a problem for Black intimacy. That's a problem in Black families. That Black women are made to do the care work of families, regardless of whether we're talking about romantic or familial relationships. We're made to do the care work of communities. And then, as I've been saying of late, we are made to do the custodial work of democracy democracy, right, which is perverse in a world where now we're saying that we care about essential workers. And Black women are always fundamentally the most essential workers. And our work is so deeply devalued, even by folks who claim that they've got a working class consciousness and that they care so much about, you know, what the least of these is doing. Yeah. 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 So now we are in this time. Last Friday would have been Breonna Taylor's 27th birthday. And yeah. I saw so many people, all kinds of po people posting about her birthday. Happy birthday to Brianna. Shout out to Kate Young, who, who organized that came, campaign and originated it. Um, and I sometimes get the feeling that's a little performative. But I wonder, does it matter if it's performative? Look, I think that we should be calling baby girl's name every time that we can. And I think that we will... Look, I'm both bothered by what I like to call performative wokeness and also understand that in a revolution, you've got all type of people and all type of motives, right? And that we don't really have the space to be trying to police why people are showing up. What we hope is that in the showing up, if they do it enough, that it becomes transformative in its own right. Now, I know people are in it for street cred. People are doing a lot of stuff these days for street cred in movements. Um, and that deeply bothers me. But I think that for our own sanity and well-being, we just have to keep being focused on where the best focus for our outrage is. Um, you know, that maybe if we lived in a world that we that cared about Black girls the way it should, then we wouldn't, you know, then maybe Brianna would be here, right? Maybe George Floyd would be here. Like, that's the world we're fighting for, that we not celebrate birthdays of people who've already passed on because they have been snatched from us. And so we just got to stay focused. But um, but I am bothered, you know, by the by the desire for street cred. Like, both, I want to fight those people that show up to the protests and take pictures and put them on Instagram. Like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, but I also, but that thing where people feel like, they, you know, they, where they're just doing it because they want to say that they did something, you know, the thing that I'm always wanting to say to them is there are a lot of ways to resist. Protest is a lifestyle. This work of the long Black freedom struggle is all about what you do every day for Black freedom and not what you do in any one moment, um, which I hope lets folks off the hook who feel all of this pressure to sort of show up in this moment when maybe they can't. Um, and which I hope gives Black women the space to also be like, I'm tired of the focus always being on brothers. And so I don't actually feel compelled to show up right now. You said that years ago. Um, was it about Eric Garner? I remember, like, that was one of the... That's the next question. Know. That's the next question. Okay, yep. Yep, yep, yep. We yep, don't yep, get yep. there. We don't get there. Yeah. Okay, don't All let right, me well, let's, yep. let's get there. Because... Okay. 
six years ago, I wrote an article about how I was so deeply hurt by the fact that Black women show up, that we are on the proverbial front, well, the literal and proverbial front lines, that we um, extend ourselves emotionally, psychically, physically for people who will not show up for us. Now, my politics have evolved just a little bit, but there is increasing investment from a lot of Black women on the internet saying, we're not going. We're, we're not showing up, sorry. <laughs> Y'all got it, okay? So what do you say to Black women who look around, see our continual erasure, see the fact that we are seen as collateral damage, that we are still an afterthought, and say, you know what? It's a pandemic outside. I'm staying at home. Yeah. Look, I say stay your ass at home. Like, you deserve it. Like, look, I, I sent you a note after that happened and people showed out with you because I appreciated your willingness to say it. And in that moment, I was in the streets and I had resolved it differently, but I, but I understood how important it was for you to be a dissenting voice and to say to us, well, how are we going to force some level of reciprocity? Y'all have put us in the perverse position of saying, black men have put us in the per perverse position of saying, if we just keep showing up, you'll never know what it means for us not to show up, right? And I'm not here for Black women having abusive relationships. And that's almost what our relationship to Black politics is. So I thought it took great courage to say it. Um, I thought people were mad at the moment in which you said it. But what other moment is there to say it, right? What other moment is there to exact cost? And what I think is super interesting is the way that people are very angry with Black women when we begin to draw lines. People call them a phone <laughs> when we begin to say this far and no farther right or i've given you all that i'm going to give because folks are very invested in women black women being in this sacrificial mode people like us to be jesus right give everything for us lay down your life for us die on the cross for us and then you'll be gone but we'll be here no I heard a resounding no. And the thing that I have struggled to learn in my life as a black woman is that, you know, one of my homegirls told, told me years ago, she said, look, no is my default answer, right? No is my default answer. Then if I reverse, then I'll give a yes. And I struggle with that because yes is my default answer. And then I heard it said this way, if I can't give you a no, then my yes means nothing. And so I felt like you gave integrity to our protest in your choice to offer that it's a legitimate political response for black women to say no. If we can't say no to the demand that we be in the streets and we don't get any reciprocity, then our yes is a coerced yes, even when we don't recognize it, even when we think we're choosing it. And I, you know, and so I think that our politics are made better by the sisters who are like, we get to have some boundaries here, some choices here about what we're gonna do. Um, and I think that that no, it's particularly important in this moment of pandemic where I have watched people who I think are deeply thoughtful. And it has been a struggle for me because I am like, listen, I believe in protests. I've been in the streets in this movement um, and been a partner and an ally in this movement. And I am staying my black ass in the house because um, it's a pandemic. It has killed 22,000 black people in three months. And Folks are out here all masked up together, not social distancing, and talking about the cause of freedom. And what I know is that when the numbers spike, what those people are relying on is a care economy powered by Black women to hold them and take care of them when they come back home. They know that the care economy ain't going to be at the hospital. We already know the hospitals can't handle a surge in cases. So who's going to nurse you back to health? And who's going to make sure that even in a pandemic, you get a funeral if you don't make it? And who's going to tend to your things? The Black women who are at home. And so they're already relying on our labor, whether they go to the protest or they don't go, to save and, and, and uphold the community. And I think we need to say more of that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say that for years, for the past six years, people have been trying to cancel me. I'm like, y'all been trying to cancel me for six years, you guys. It's a, it, it ain't working. And in fact, that line of thinking has actually gained traction since that was my So y'all just need to give it up. We still living good right. out here. 
Um, yeah. And I also want to say that if, with regards to that and some of the other stances that I take about the ways that I center Black women, Black women's needs, and also getting money to Black women, people try to weaponize selfishness, right? Saying you're selfish, you're self-interested. That's not a Black feminist politic. And I really do believe that people try to throw that at me when it is not true. I have a long history of work that <laughs> says that that is not true that they try to throw that at me to compel me to martyr myself, to compel yeah. me to, to engage in compulsory labor. And it's just not going to happen. I do what I want to do. We're free around here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about it, sis. Yeah. You no, know, I mean, look, also, don't let people weaponize Black feminism against you, right? Because no, I don't... What I just be like, you ain't read the tradition because if you had, if you said that shit to Audre Lorde, I just that is when I call up my deep south side eye of Audre Lorde talking very crazy to James Baldwin in 1984 and basically saying, Look, we can't say the community if we're not alive, James. Like that is her, you know, because he's like, You know, because black men just have it so hard and these brothers that you need to understand why well, she's like, Uh uh. So if Audre Lorde is like, Brother Baldwin, you know then yes, sisters get to say no to brothers. We get to say, that ain't about selfishness. It's actually about self-preservation. And why, if you ain't gonna look out for me, then who else is gonna look out for me, right? right? If there's not a black protest movement that under, like I, I was talking on my Facebook page to Dr. Beverly Gosheftal the other day, who was both my, you know, feminist, black feminist pioneer and also uh, a professor of mine. And she said, look, she said the inability of folks to think about pandemics in this moment and to keep on being driven by a black male centered protest narrative she was like that's why they can't think about the like like just for example you have all of this super impressive inspiring people power in the streets in the middle of a pandemic and has anybody made a demand on the state to actually have more testing more hospital beds more protection for all these people that have been exposed to this to covid what is the purpose of if a pandemic is killing 22,000 black people in three months and people are massively in the streets during that pandemic why is that not one of the demands i mean literally police departments are talking about defunding themselves and look like we could get anything we fucking want right now so go for everything including the most urgent thing and so what dr uh, gashetal said to me is but when black men are at the center of your politics therefore the only thing you think about is how the state kills them then the more obvious political concerns that you could use your people power to move you miss them right yes. and so when we're talking about a black feminist politic, it isn't just about saying that you need to talk specifically about black women. It is also about saying that this one urgent story, which we don't need to diminish because all of us are appalled and enraged by what that motherfucker did to George Floyd, right? Mm -hmm. But we are saying that that story makes us miss the other things that we need to focus yes. on in black yes. politics we are not a one issue people yes but we are out in the streets like if you defund like because what happens if they defund police departments all over the country tomorrow which is the vision we've been fighting for but in three weeks time what we don't have is enough hospitals to house all the folks who have covid right or you don't have health care you don't have access to health care that's right you don't have health care. You don't have, we got our people dying in nursing homes, you know, um, make, having to make terrible choices, not being able to see their elders. Yes. Um, you know, we're, we're exposing black women who are the, you know, the certified nursing assistants and essential workers who do these jobs and, and sit with the elderly and all of those. Those are the kinds of things that black women in my community do if they're working class and make money. Um, and so they're being exposed and we don't have an analysis of that because we are like, this is the one thing we can change. And I'm like, yes, we need to change it. No one's de debating whether or not the police, I mean, we're debating the house or whatever, but no one's debating in many ways fundamentally that we need a, a fundamental reimagining of policing, abolition, all of those things. But like, come on, you've got tens of thousands of people in the street exposed to a virus that is devastating on the body. And no one has thought that the thing you ought to be demanding is where are the tests? <laughs> yes. Where are, like, stop reopening the economy and give us a universal basic income yes. because the reopening of the economy was also about racism. Trump was like, black people are the ones dying. Let's reopen this shit. Yes. And our people are in the streets and they know that and they ain't said shit to any of the powers that be while they have them listening about what you do. 
once the cops kill us outside the house, in Breonna Taylor's case, inside the house, once we deal with that, what do you do so that Black people can actually live and thrive and see another day? That's what the vision of freedom is for. It's not just to keep bad shit from happening to us. It's also to have resources so that we can live. And that's what the COVID, if we had a response to that, it would lead us into that discussion, right? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay, so I read this morning on the Crunk Feminist Collective website, the Black Women Demands post. And something yeah. that I so appreciated that you just touched on was how expansive those demands are. Could we talk a little bit about why it's useful for us to conceive of state violence as something beyond the police just murdering people or police brutality? Yeah. So um, so my, my uh, Crunk Feminist sister, Sheree Davis, wrote that. She's a long time labor organizer that's the work that she does and so she put those demands out we're you know very thankful um it's cool to be in a feminist collective right um because they're always sort of an expansive approach um so look black women's maternal mortality issues the fact that you know you have like these hotepi type dudes who are always like abortion is trying to kill the community then on the other side of that, we see a Black woman's maternal mortality crisis where Black women are dying astronomically in childbirth, largely, they think, because the way that racism affects the body is that it has stressed the nervous system so bad that it just can't sustain healthy pregnancies, um, you know, both pre and postpartum. That's a state violence issue. That is literally that the, the, that the state has made the Black woman's body a place that cannot engage its reproductive justice function. And here's the thing, protecting, I'm not even, I don't even, I'm not even trying to be cisgender focused here, but let me say that if the whole thing that Black women did for the Republic was that they had babies during enslavement to power the labor force here, and you arrive you know, hundreds of years later at a moment where now that that isn't our job, our own bodies are so stressed out that they can't have the babies we want to have, right? Then what you have, what you have is a state violence project that has been wholly successful in co-opting Black women's reproductive labor for its own uses and us having no agency over that. And you can't have a freedom project if you don't repair that fundamental breach of Black women's own bodily autonomy, right? And the bodily autonomy of any person who can just date a baby. If you don't deal with that, then what kind of freedom project are we talking about? So we're talking about that. We're thinking about housing, right? So Wells Fargo just did some foolishness with the with the small business loans and, and all of that, that that were part of the Relief Act, part of the CARES Act. So that is a company that has been fined millions, hundreds of millions of dollars over the years for the, for the banking crisis in 2008, for setting up terrible accounts in people's names, you know, a couple years ago, and now for somehow managing not to give Black small businesses loans, right? That disproportionately affects Black women because we're disproportionate, you know, number of Black small business owners, we're disproportionate number of Black homeowners, and so don't you know so that becomes the state the, the government colluding with corporations to wall black folks out of wealth building housing security and when you have housing insecurity you also have things like educational insecurity and food insecurity because it affects the quality of your neighborhood when you begin to talk about black women's issues then you can't just be talking about police violence you've got to have a conversation about reproductive justice a conversation about housing and look because I'm a fat girl, people always like when I'm in the public to comment on my body, you know, and, and, and have lots to say about Black women's bodies. I'm interested in making the argument, too, that, that I, I mean, one, I don't think fat bodies are a problem, but, you know, to the extent that weight, when it does create problems for us, that, too, is a state violence issue. And people always laugh at me when I say this, but the same thing that's causing a problem for us with maternal mortality is also causing a problem for us with weight and health, right? It's continual stress on the body. It's the way that Black folks saw George Floyd get killed, and surely our cortisol levels were through the roof as we saw that, as we saw the cops face, you know, shoot our people with rubber bullets all night long for a week. That level of stress response in the body, we feel it collectively, it has physical impacts, it affects metabolic responses, it means that it's harder for us to lose weight when we try to, it means that it's harder for us to have babies. I suspect that if people would actually 
commit governmental funding to study autoimmune disorders, we would come to find out that Black women suffer from those disproportionately because basically our bodies are stuck in fight response. We fight to survive, and then when we relax, our bodies just fight themselves, mm -hmm. right? And so all of those kinds of things are the conversations you have when Black women get to be at the center of a, of a conversation about state violence, right? Um, you know, and last when, you know, and then we talk about black women and incarceration and, you know, and all of the, uh, you know, terrible things that attend to the incarcerated population, you know, to incarcerated folks, but that attend to sisters who are incarcerated, both cisgender and transgender sisters who are incarcerated, right? So we got to think about all of those things. And so then you just, when you look at that list, and it's not even an exhaustive list, and then you think we've got people power like we haven't seen in my lifetime. And we basically have come to these people with one issue. Yes. Defund yes. the police. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, I, I wanted to make a note that when I say Black women and Black girls, that I'm not just talking about cisgender Black women and Black girls, that I am talking about trans Black women and Black girls, that I'm extending that empathy and that um, commitment to being in community with our non-binary siblings, right? So I just want to make it clear that this is an inclusive discussion and that I do not want to be the asshole who participates in the erasure of the trans folks. And we also know that trans people and non-binary people experience a kind of state violence, a kind of police brutality that we often, often miss. So I just want to, to lay that out there. Um, and look, um, and Kim, you know, and remember that a trans sister was attacked in the streets of Minneapolis by four black men during the protest. Yes. You know, yes. like, like they took a break from the protest that's about saving black men's lives to viciously attack a trans black woman. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. This is what this is what like this is why we cannot have a cisgender male centered politic because they like we see this sister over here living her life out here in the streets fighting for freedom and we like well let's go on and like what in the world? Right. That's all right. Freedom can wait. Let's take some yeah. time to <laughs> let's go on and yeah. Like no yeah. that's not what we're doing here, right? right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as the masses begin to realize that investing in broad social transformation will improve all our lives, it seems to me like Black feminist theory should be more popular than ever. Um, but I feel like a lot of people are scooping up the theory part and scooping up some of those terms and terminology and extracting the Black feminist part out of it. And that concerns me not because I'm obsessed with credit. People are always like, you just want credit. You're so selfish. It concerns me because I think that we definitely miss something when we, we don't think about what it means to have Black women's bodies and our lives and our experiences at the center of our theorizing. So how can we make sure that at this moment of so much change that the needs of the most marginalized people are met and that we are not simply reproducing the the shit and the erasure and the exclusion that was how we got here yeah no it's a great question and one i think about a lot so one i think that this is why the work that you're doing is so important and one of the things i'm most excited about in this moment is the way that black feminism has moved outside the academy because see the academy has particular theoretical investments it only wants the theory it 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 assigns value based upon how theoretical you can prove yourself to be, which is why you have all of these academics who are like, I'm an intersectional whatever, but they ain't, but they don't have no quality relationships with Black women. They don't support Black women as they move through the academy, but they have the language of intersectionality, right? Because it has theoretical heft and it can move in ways that the body cannot, right? So folks are very happy to extract our theoretical heft because that gives them currency and cachet as they move about. You know, you say I'm an intersectional feminist and immediately people think that you're woke, you know? Oh, they really get it. You know, they're one of our people. But that is sloganeering. That's not necessarily, it doesn't have anything to do with your politics or the quality of your relationships. And so everybody's comfortable with what Black women say until they have to actually sit down and encounter a Black woman's body, her conversation, her rage, her commitments, her emotions, her feelings. Then nobody knows what to do, right? And so I like that 
in moving outside of the academy, there are conversations that you can have. There is work that you can do. There is community building that can happen that cannot happen when you are trying to play the academic game, which is all about proving that you're smart enough to be there, proving that your frameworks are intellectual enough to be worthy of institutional value uh, and support. Um, you know, and you know, look, I mean, I think that we should just continue to say that Black women, cis, trans, and non-binary femmes are the most marginalized, despised folks in our society. I think that that's true. I think we could add some other identities to that, like folks with disabilities. But in general, Black women are hated and despised. We miss that because we see the spectacular forms of violence that Black men experience. But there's also on the other side a, a set of places where Black men are fetishized. There's a way in which we've had a Black man president. There's a way in which Black men can run and lead corporations and businesses. So I'm not trying to take anything away from brothers, but I am trying to say that I still fundamentally believe that Black women are at the bottom of the totem pole here. And that's not about oppression Olympics, because please trust, honey, that we're not out here acting like we're at the bottom of it. <laughs> we are clear, like, we the best, right? right. Right. So we don't we don't assume the downtrodden narrative, but structurally speaking, whether we're talking about wealth, whether we're talking about health care, whether we're talking about um, whether we're talking about politics and political power, black women just continue to be on the bottom of those conversations. The only other folks, you know, that I think we should always acknowledge in that conversation is indigenous people who have also been ravaged by COVID, ravaged yes. by the state, yes. ravaged by sexual violence, right? That sort of thing. Um you know, and we've got to figure out our solidarities there. But there's a way, there's something that the Black woman's body does in the American body politics symbolically that's super important. So I've been thinking about this a lot and trying to figure out how to write about it. Like, part of the challenge that we have in this moment is that when you say, for instance, that you want to defund the police, what you're actually asking for is a reinvestment in public life. You're asking for a reinvestment in public, a, in, a, in a robust social safety net and public welfare system that can equalize things for citizens. But the reason that the notion of the public is so maligned in this moment is because it's tethered to a Black woman's body. Think yeah. about it. When you say, who need public assistance? Who need public housing? Yes. Everybody thinks about a Black woman as a well welfare queen who was a lazy, undeserving, poor person, right? So the, the ability to march away from an investment in public life has been done on the backs of the maligned Black woman's body. And so you can't, you can't actually decide that you're going to reinvest in any notion of a robust public sphere in this country until the country reckons with its hatred of Black women. You can't defund the police and reinvest in public life if you don't reckon with your hatred of Black women because the reason that white people get in these powerful positions and march away from that work is because they're like, we don't want to give it to the undeserving poor. And they're always thinking about a Black woman who doesn't deserve shit, right? They're not thinking about Black men on welfare. It's a gendered narrative. Yes. So, you know, so that's, so that's part of the challenge is that we've got to not let our theory and our, you know, our theoretic, our increasing theoretical sophistication make us forget. Barbara Smith did this, for, taught me this. Barbara Smith, member of Combahee River Collective, taught me this um, the very first time the Crunk Feminist Collective ever gave a panel 10 years ago. We were, somebody said, well, what does feminism mean to you? All of us were going on. My mama was a feminist and didn't claim it and telling all of these earthy stories, you know, which are all wonderful. And Barbara Smith just gave us the side eye and looked at us and got the mic. She said, feminism is an oppression to end, she said, feminism is a movement to end actual oppression against women. And that was a clarion call. Because all of a sudden I was like, right. That's the thing I'm saying. Feminism isn't just theory, it's politics, it's practice, it's a movement to end actual oppression. And if you are ever so sophisticated in your theorizing that we don't know what to, that you can't immediately reach for the politics that attend to that theorizing, then you, 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 are, you are missing the mark. You might look like you're ahead of everybody else, but in my thinking, you're behind everybody. Yes, yes. material conditions, yes. yes. Yes, all the time. Okay, um, so let's talk about the police. I had a conversation with Derricka Purnell and Charlene Carruthers, love them so much, obsessed with their work. And yes. I believe it was Charlene who said that when this came up, 
you pushed back and said that you had a concern that if we eliminate policing and prisons, that Black yeah. women and Black girls would be particularly vulnerable. Do you still yeah. have that concern? Absolutely. Um, look. I, Charlene and I talked about this five years ago now. I'll never forget the conversation. Um, we were in a room at, you know, in the height of Black Lives Matter. Uh, Ruth Gilmore was there. and we We're chopping it up about abolition. And I said to them a, a thing that I shared in eloquent rage. I'm the childhood survivor of domestic violence. My father struggled with addiction. He was violent. My mother, um, as I tell the story in the book, was the victim of gun violence while she was pregnant with me. A former lover shot both my mother and my father out of jealousy over their relationship. And all of us live to tell the tale. And I, so I have a deep fear of, I have seen the levels of violence that Black men can do in my life um, in ways that many Black girls can relate to. And I know that there have been moments as a kid surviving a domestic violence situation where I've had to call the cops as a kid. As an adult, I would think differently about it, but when, when, I, when you're watching someone attack your mother, then what you want is for someone to come help, right? And that is the thing that I shared with Charlene, that what I don't trust is that Black men have done the work they need to do for us to coexist without any intervening forces, right? And so what I'm committed to in this moment, here, here are the competing truths that I both have had to call the police as a mode of protection against violent Black men. And that I also recognize that in the end, the police didn't ultimately protect my family, right? Mm -hmm. The man who shot my mother did a few years in prison, got out, and like right as he got out, he immediately came looking for my mother. Yes. I have met this man multiple times so the being in jail and the the being the being arrested the being convicted the being put in prison that did, wasn't the reason that my mother is still here today right um and what that brother needed was some serious mental health intervention so i'm trying to figure out how to hold both truths that what i am driven by which sometimes I don't think restorative justice communities and transformative justice communities are driven by. See, they say that they're driven by justice for the victim, but I feel when I talk to them, when I read their stuff, that mostly what they are driven by is a desire not to be unjust to the people who have committed the acts. If you think about restorative, like so much of our conversation is about how punishment is too tough we're never typically adjudicating like whether or not the brother did the thing but whether or not locking him up in prison for his whole life is a form of justice it's a fair question but it's not the first question if you've actually been through violence in your life right my first question is not about my daddy and what's just for him <laughs> it's what's just for my mother Right. Um, so I said this to Ruth Gilmore and she was like, it's so interesting that you say this because abolition was founded by black women who are who were survivors of violence. So here's what I say to people. I am on the journey toward abolition because I recognize and have my family has been ravaged by the police. Look, I, you know, I haven't written this in print because print circulates in ways that some things don't. But I said on a broadcast yesterday. Exactly one day, not even 24 full hours before Breonna Taylor was murdered in her bed, the cops used, took a no-knock warrant to my childhood home and bust into my mama's house with a no-knock warrant. Not 24 hours before Breonna Taylor was murdered. Bust a, a hole in the front door, broke out the windows uh, because I have a relative who struggles with addiction and who lives in that house. And, all the, and he struggles with all the things that come with addiction. And so I watched the cops saw pictures of the way that the cops destroyed my childhood home, a uh, home my mother still owns. So I'm not invested in the police. I'm not invested in the idea that they are safe or that they can protect us or that they are the best solution. But what I'm pushing for is I want the conversation about Black women and girls' safety to be at the center of every conversation about restorative justice. And very often, the conversation seems to be about what the state and what systems of injustice do to Black men and not about what they mean when it comes to safety and protection of Black women and girls. That's what I expressed to Charlene. That's what I expect to express to Ruth Gilmore. And what they said to me was, well, Ruth did, you know, 
the that the founders of this movement were black women and so for me to think that abolition is anti-black woman in some way is to miss the thinking that goes into it and so i so because i trust the thinking that black women do i'm giving abolition a hearing in my own life but i also don't do this when we talk about performative wokeness i don't like claiming positions that i haven't worked my way through yet Yes. Because sometimes we claim politics before we figured out how to embody those politics and really sat with what it what we have to risk in order to get there. So if you just out here yelling defund the police and abolish and all of that, it might actually be the place we need to go. But I want to go there because I have deeply considered it. And because when I go into my community and say this to people, I am saying that it with a clear sense that those policy positions aren't going to mean that then problematic brothers who haven't done their work are going to be in the position ravaging communities because of the demons that they struggle with. Mm -hmm. And that is a conversation that we have to have. And otherwise, our politics are facile. They're empty and they sound good, but they don't actually deal with the material conditions that our folks are facing. And so I know that I sound like a contrarian and maybe I sound unwoke, but what I am is deeply committed to making sure black women and girls are good. I want to know what does it look like to build a world where black girls wake up every morning and they feel safe? Because I feel like that's the compass, right? And I feel like whatever a black girl says justice feels like for her is what we should be fighting for. And so, you know, so that, so that, that's it. That's the thing that I was trying to work through with Charlene. And we heard each other, you know, I, I felt like, um, I, you know, I also want to model in my feminist scholarship that we get to be in process on things. We don't always have to have arrived at the place that everyone says we should be at immediately, right? Yeah. So I will say that I really, I hate that you have to, to list off your trauma to like add it to your resume, but I have been uh, the victim of sexual violence and I am invested in defunding the police prison abolition. Um, I do... I do want to be more invested in disrupting cycles of violence than punishment. I want the person who assaulted me to not do it again. He's currently incarcerated, not for sexual violence, for some other shit, because we know how difficult it is for rapists to be incarcerated. And he's gonna get out. And what is he gonna do when he gets out? Who's the next person that he's going to assault? And so I, my stance is I want us to divert all of the funds all of the stuff that we put there into actually mm -hmm. helping people who are abused by helping abusers. And I understand yeah. people don't like that. People mm. don't like it. I get, I understand why you don't like it, but I read this really great book called Decriminal Decriminalizing Domestic Violence by Lee Goodmar. And what we are talking about is extending the community and social supports to women so that well, people who are abused, so that if you find yourself in um, an abused, abusive relationship, are you even able to get away, right? Like, do you, are you able to find somewhere to live? Are you able to feed your children? But also, a lot of women who are in abusive relationships don't want to leave. They don't want to leave. They don't want to subject their, their partners to the um, brutal and abusive prison industrial complex. Right. And that stuff is not going to be fixed. I, I, I don't foresee a, a time when that stuff gets fixed, where um, policing and prisons invest themselves deeply in the lives. If they don't care about white women's lives, what, are we ever going to be able to get to a point where those institutions are deeply invested in the lives of Black women and Black children? I think right. we're settling. I think we're settling right now. I think we yeah. can do better. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right about that. I think you're right about it. And I think that I'm I'm ultimately saying that I'm still moving from this primal place of like, but how, see, because this is my frustration with movements as a person who is in movements. You know, there's a lot of judgment. Um, I, you know, people like to talk about the 60s, but I'm a scholar of Black women in the 1890s night through about the 1920s 30s and so all these you know very fancy bougie respectability type black women in the 19 you know 10s 20s and 30s who were club women 
one of the things that was most revolutionary about them is that in, in the face of a government that had abandoned them during Reconstruction, these Black women were like, we have to build a social safety net for our people. So they raised the money, they built the schools, they built the hospitals, they built libraries, they built a, they literally constructed a society for Black folks abandoned by the government in the, in the, in the aftermath of Reconstruction to live and have the things that they needed. What we have in this moment is a lot of folks talking about how to build Excuse me. <laughs> we have a lot of folks talking about how to build this new world, but we don't have a lot of, but we also have that in a moment where we have deep institutional distrust. So we have a yeah. generation of young folks who don't like institutions, who are not joiners, who are, who balk at the conservatism of institutions, not understanding that if you don't have institutions, you can't provide services for black people. And so yeah. Uh, that is that is really my thing is I'm saying I'm on I agree with you wholeheartedly I even agree with abolition in principle you are absolutely right we are settling for a system that we know doesn't serve us because it wasn't built with us in mind or or it had us in mind as the people to be policed killed controlled and to assert power over right so I understand all of that but what I want is I need to be able, before you tell me that you're going to defund the police, I need to know what institution you're going to build. And here's the thing that's interesting. Think about it. So we're going to defund the police, which I think we should. I mean, the police are trash. Okay. So we're going to defund, <laughs> defund the police. And we're saying we want to put money in institutions, but who going to control those institutions? Are they Black community institutions? Yeah. Are they other state-run agencies that have state-run priorities and understandings of Black folks? Are, the, are these folks going to cede control of that money to the people who know these communities and can design these institutions? Yeah. Right? Because, uh, because that's the difference, is that because Black folks didn't have nothing in the 1890s, they were like, we building it from the ground up and we control and we take care of our people. And I and so people hate those women because they were mini, bougie and they were mean girls. But they also, but black people knew where they could go to get a meal. Black women who were, you know, who were at risk of being sexually trafficked in the 1910s and 20s had places that they could go for support and to get employment, etc. Like that's the kind of stuff that black women were building back then. So I'm saying we can't. You can't be everything. You can't hate institutions, hate the state what community control you can't have community control without institution building right you can't redirect state funds to community projects unless you acknowledge that you think that the state can do good in the way that it directs money so like folks aren't thinking through all the pieces they're just saying this is what we need and i'm like yeah but what does it look like to build it? Because when you ask the least of these to get on board with your revolution, the only way they do that is if you actually provide the services that they need. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so, I mean, because that's, that's why people love the Black Panthers. In this moment, you know, we revered the Black Panthers because they had a breakfast program, because they had health clinics. Yes. Because why did the Black Panthers understand that, in, that you have to feed people and you have to take care of their medical care? Are our people creating health clinics? Are they creating massive, broad-scale free breakfast programs? Are those the demands that they're demanding that this money go to? Or, like, I mean, I've read the Black Lives Matter platform and did a little bit of consulting on it. So it is very comprehensive and super impressive. And if people listen to that, I'm on board with the vision for that, right? But I need people. This is also why you pay attention to Black women. And this is why I'm a historian of those early Black women, because the, the way in which they understood the project of building a society for Black people in a world that didn't love them is something that folks have rejected because they hate those women's class politics. And they hate <laughs> that, that, that those women you know, were invested in like sort of creating a respectable Black person. And it is problematic, right? Like, we don't have to get on board with that part. But we miss then the brilliant thinking around like, so I'm gonna build a kindergarten. I'm gonna build a library. You build a nursing home. This one build a hospital, you know? And we, you know, like that's the kind of stuff they did. And until, and we're not going to have the revolution we want until we get back to the space where we're thinking about what it means to do that in a, in a surveillance state where the state is, does not trust black people and is deeply invested in intruding on every facet of black life. 
Yeah, yes. You know what makes me so mad? And I think this is because I took many classes with Evelyn Brooks taking Botham in college. I get so mad when people reflexively shit on respectability politics or the politics of respectability. I, it makes me so furious the, because people haven't done the reading. Let's just be honest. They don't know what they're doing with yeah. And it is just, it comes from this place of ignorance and looking down. On, and I'm like, do you know those women did? Like, you don't even, you know, you, you're on Twitter all day. Like, they actually built shit. Yeah. Yeah. Impressive shit. Like, built kindergartens that then, you know, built the first kindergartens in cities, right? Built the libraries that Black people read in. And those libraries exist today. They just were taken over by the city, you know, when you, the municipal governments of lots of these cities, right? So uh, you're seeing in the in the built landscape of many of these places, the the living remnants of Black women's institution building in this moment where Black folks didn't have it. And we out here acting like we don't know what to do. And I'm like, we're spending all our time yelling at the state. And I'm, look, I'm not one of these people that's like, we should just build our own and own our own things. Because, I mean, I think that's simplistic. But I am saying, like, you can't be an anti-institutionalist and think that you can actually create a revolution for Black people, like, that for actual Black people who need actual things that you are asking them to divest in the state's ability to provide. Yes, yes. Okay, so let's talk about, so a lot of people know you from your book, Eloquent Rage. I saw you post on Facebook that it's now sold 50,000 copies. Huge yeah. deal, congratulations. Thank Loved you. Eloquent Rage, but you know what I stand beyond respectability. That is my <laughs> I freaking love that book. So that book is about the intellectual contributions, the intellectual labor of Black women in the late 19th century and, and early to mid 20th century. So freaking good. And I loved it because people can imagine Black women as everything but thinkers. They, they, we can be warriors, we can be activists, we can create, be creatives, but nobody wants to give us credit for those intellectual contributions. So why was it important for you to write that book? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I don't get to talk about beyond respectability a lot. So thanks for the question. It's exactly what you said. Um, I was really irritated that, you know, that people have this understanding of Black history where they're like, well, it's Frederick Douglass and it's W.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. And then, you know, we skip a little bit and then it's King and X, right? And then you skip some more time and it's like Cornell West and Henry Louis Gates, right? So we could just tell the history of like the 19th and 20th century is like a history of race men. And all of those men are in deep community with Black women interlocutors, right? So Ida B. Wells is in the mix with Booker T. Washington and um, W.B. Du Bois. So is Anna Julia Cooper, right? So is a woman named Mary Church Terrell. These women are part of an organization called the National Association of Colored Women. And we typically think of that organization as important because of all of the social labor that they did, like I said, building schools, hospitals, whatever. But I argue in this book that it really was an intellectual training ground for this first generation of Black women public intellectuals. And Black women were always public intellectuals because they didn't have the institutional purchase to be anything but that. So they learned things and then they went into communities and said, we want to teach our people these things. We want to be in dialogue with our folks. We know that the best way to serve our folks is with the quality of the ideas that we bring to them, right? And so you look at somebody like a Du Bois and, you know, you learn at college like double consciousness or what have you. But no one has done, you know, the work in, you know, Mary Church Terrell's archive to think about like her consciousness concept of dignified agitation, right? Uh, where she says, look, like we should give white people hell, but we also can do it in this respectable way. Whether you agree with her on the respectability piece or not, she's making an argument about how black politics ought to happen that she doesn't get credit for and that spans a life, like 60 years of activism. So I fell in love with those black women because I read them and I read them to be arguing over and over again that they wanted people to take them seriously as intellectuals. Anna Julia Cooper was like, black women are great thinkers on the questions of the age, not just on racial questions, but questions of government questions of nation states she was saying that in 1892 don't relegate us either to the back bend of gender politics or even racial politics bring us into the full scale of american life and let us comment on the things that we think ought to happen and i want people to know who our major black women intellectuals were and i got to you know get to be part of a tradition of black women historians and black feminist thinkers who have done that work um 
And so, yeah. So I wanted people to be able to walk away from that book and be like, this, you know, here are a set of concepts that come from each of these women that we talk about, right? Um, whether Cooper or Terrell, Fanny Barry or Williams, who is my favorite? Like Fanny Barry or Williams, you know, people love, you know, it irritates me because every year we get a new book on Du Bois. And I'm like, Fanny Barry Williams wrote a lot. She would assuredly have been a political theorist if she'd had the education available. You can see that kind of thinking percolating in her work. And I don't agree with her about everything, but she's just super interesting, you know? And so her, I don't write as much about Ida in this book. Mostly I write about how Ida and Mary really didn't get along and had beef or, <laughs> or whatever. Because I also try to tell you something of the ladies, like who they were. They weren't just thinkers that, you know, uh, like Ida B. Wells liked to shop. She was she was really she into the yeah, Ida, well, Ida B. Wells sometimes spent her rent money on pretty dresses. It's true. Yes. But yes. the other thing I like about Ida B. Wells is you know before she married Ferdinand Bar Barnett, you know Ida had game, man. Ida was out here running dudes. She had this reputation for being a flirt, and so you read her diary, and she's like. You know, and then this one came over to the parlor and then that one was over at the parlor and then one got mad because they were like, you know, you out here, you know, how dare you, you know, be talking to him, you talking to me. And she, you know, so like she, you see her as like a 20 something year old woman and she has many dudes at the parlor, right? Many love letters, right? In the years before she becomes kind of this anti-lynching activist and then she gets married and all of that stuff. And then I just like, I'll come do your lecture, but I gotta, you gotta get me and, you know, hire somebody to take care of my baby. Or I'm bringing my, my nanny with me to hold my baby while I give this lecture. So that's also a model of like, well, how do you have a high profile career and a baby on the hip? Well, you don't have to look at your random white lady who's talking about, can we have it all? Look at Ida B. Wells, you know? Yeah. And so I love those women. And the last one I talk about is Polly Murray, who needs all the books, all the movies, all the shows. Uh, you know, today, Polly Murray would be a trans, would identify as a trans person, uh, but in, but wanted hormone therapy in the 1930s before that shit was even heard of, was like, well, I read this thing and they said that, you know, they give men testosterone to make them more virile. So why can't they just give it to me so that I can express my male characteristics, right? Super ahead of her time. Um, by decades and decades, and but also at the forefront of every major social movement of the 20th century, um, you know, civil rights attorney, poet, writer, um, feminist activist, um, you know, judicial pioneer, um, theologian, uh, you know, like, I mean, I, the woman is just so impressive that, um, you know, she really blows my mind. And so it was an honor to be able to write about her, too. All right, so I will note that I don't know how, but my account has, well, the For Harriet account has special privileges and we don't end at an hour. I have two more questions. Do you have time? Okay, okay, okay. yep. All right. Okay. Um, so we're in this very anti-white women moment, just like, fuck Karen. Like, that's the, the move that we're on right now. And over the past couple of weeks, so many white women have reached out to me. So many people I've never heard of in my life. People saying, I'm, I've been following you for 10 years, but this is the first time I've reached out though, but that's okay, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> um, they want, they say they want to know and do better. What do we need white women to do and be right now? Oh God. <sighs> what do we need them to do and be? Mm. I need them mm, to I need them to really interrogate what what it means for them to be so invested in white supremacy that they are and the privileges it provides that they're willing to overlook patriarchy, right? I mean, I just it's not clear to me that white women are actually getting as much as they think they're getting because of their proximity to whiteness. The thing that teaches me that is like the Me Too movement, right? You have all these quote unquote beautiful white women who have money and power and fame, and yet they're still stifled in their careers by men who can do acts of sexual violence to them at will, even though they're rich, right? Which says that patriarchy continues to be a problem even when you have access to the trappings of whiteness. Um, and there's no kind of freedom in that, right? So I need them to really think about that. Um, I need them to um, to read books and stop calling black women and asking for help and just read the, read all the books that black women have written. Watch all the watch all the shows. Read the books. Um, you know, and the last thing I need them to do is vote different. 
right. both different. We have yes. Trump because the motherfuckers voted this way for him. If white women alone would just vote different, this whole thing would look different, right? If they could figure out how to get all these white chicks that's got money and privilege to stop voting for Republicans and vote for a progressive candidate, they could shift the whole fabric of American life. Like, that's a level of power that they have. Black women are literally voting at the top of our voting capacity to just hold it in the road. But they could keep a, get us solidly on the, on the right side of the line if they would just vote with as people with conscience. Um, yeah, you know, and look, the, I mean, the last thing is, I need white women to stop saying, I need them to stop yelling at black women about how they want us to be unified as women. And I need them in these liberal organizations to stop undercutting black women, right? Stop saying that you about this life and then you micromanage the hell out of the sister. You bring her in, but then you don't allow her to do the job. You throw her under the bus. You're catty. You're passive aggressive. You be out here provoking black women, and then they want to box you. But you've been passive aggressive, right? You femin you weaponize your femininity, and then you don't have to own it. It becomes a form of gaslighting. It makes black women feel crazy and violent, right? Um, and you know, and the last thing I've been saying to white folks is, don't do that shit where you see me out here on the chopping block. I'm taking hits, whether in the meeting, online, whatever. You don't say nothing, but then you in my inbox, my DMs, or my ear whispering, talking about, you really handled that so well, and I really agree with you, and I believed your point. How is that helpful? Whispered allyship is no allyship at all. Just keep that to yourself, yeah. girl. Yes, yes. I will say I would really appreciate for white women to not participate in lowballing black women. So I know Come that we're, we're in this pay black people moment, and I have... Um, I think it's really strange that like I've been offered so many like paid opportunities over the past week or whatever. I will take the money and reinvest it in my community. That's fine. But yeah. I also know when you're trying to get over. Don't try to get over in the name of social justice. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Pay me my coin, sis. Right. Run me my money. Absolutely. Um, so, so finally, can we talk yeah. a little bit about the I am not my ancestors rhetoric? Oh, um, I hate it so much it yeah. literally makes me want to yell at people and again i think you know people not doing the reading not talking to the elders whatever so can we talk about how harmful and ahistorical that that rhetoric that kind of discussion that's kind of cropped up over the past like couple of weeks i've seen many signs and many t-shirts and i do not understand what y'all are doing yeah, see, this is the problem with this a historic. See, don't make me see you gonna make me fight and, like and cuss and do bad. Okay, this is the problem with the mo. This is the thing that I'm also trying to say about this moment. Let, so let me begin with this moment and say one of the things that has annoyed me about the way that this moment is being talked about as a historical singularity. So people are like, you know, you know, we look at look at us one week in the streets and we defund the police, baby. That's not how that happened. Okay, like. You know, the, there there was a written platform about how to do it. You know, there that's existed for years, and then there's a contemporary movement in a racial, and then there's a long black freedom struggle, and you're part of both things, right? Concerted organizing from people who were trained by past decades of organizers, bringing their fight and their thinking, and then. A, a particular iteration of it that has been going on since Trayvon Martin was killed in 2012 and we had the million hoodies protests for him all around the country beginning in the spring of 2012. So eight years, nearly a decade of organizing in the streets and longer if you think of the 2010s as a decade of organizing from Arab Spring and Slut Walk all the way down to where we are right now, right? So you got to think about yourself as being part of a long movement struggle, because when you don't, when you start to think that you got out in the streets one time in one week in May and then got all of these things, then you, you know, then you miss that it isn't about one protest. It's about all this organizing. And then you also begin to say things like, you know, um, I'm not my ancestors, you can catch these hands. When, when, if you go and study our ancestors, they never didn't fight. There were uprisings on slave ships, right? These folks killed people coming across the ocean. They poisoned folks on plantations. They sued when they were kicked off trains in the period after enslavement. Ida B. Wells was only one person who sued a train company and won a rail line and one for being kicked off the train because they wouldn't let her sit in the ladies' car. 
you know, there Rosa Parks wasn't the first person to sit down on the bus. Neither was Claudette Colvin. Blair Kelly writes in her book, Right to Ride, about all of these massive levels of protest that Black people did over decades to fight back against white people who were disrespecting them. Some people were lynched because when their white employers disrespected them, they shot and killed those employers. That is how they ended up swinging from trees because they resisted, right? Because they didn't take it lying down. So none of us is doing anything new under the sun. None of these ideas are new. Ida B. Wells talked about the police as problematic over a hundred years ago. But what, you know, but every generation has to find their work and do it. And so it is deep disrespect to our ancestors to say that you are singular and that you are not fighting in their tradition. And in this moment, I believe our ancestors are showing up to these protests with us, showing up to these movements with us and saying, yes, baby, continue the work. We are with you. Our spirit is powering you. And so why would you cut off your access to ancestral power yes. by disrespecting the folks who figured out both how to fight and how to survive so that you could be here to make this thing better, right? I mean, it's such a gross distortion of the moment and it's so deeply rooted in, um, you know, it, it's so deeply rooted in a kind of social media driven thing where people only, you know, cause folks are literally talking about what's happening in the streets now as though we haven't been watching uprisings every damn summer for the last five or six years. Right. And we have, we've been watching the police, you know, face us down with tanks. We've been watching them tear gas us. And that's just our generation. And we ain't even the first generation to endure that. So I've been deeply bothered by the narrative about these protests as being singular in history as, you know, you ain't never seen nothing like this. You know, we ain't, you know, nothing like this has ever happened. How dare you disrespect Alicia and Opal and Patrice and Tev and Brittany Patnett? Uh, you know, all of the, you know, uh, Netta, all of these, you know, uh, Black Youth Project 100, right? Uh, Hands Up United, like all of these organizations that have been on the ground fighting for um, uh, Dream Defenders, right? Who have been on the ground in these places, raising consciousness, building capacity, clarifying demands, making sure that when the opportunity arose, that we would be prepared. That's why people are prepared. Not because they got out there with these dreams all on their own in a week's time. And so I just, I, you know, we, you sh I wrote my book because I was like, and, and this is like, it's my same issue when black women are like, I'm not a feminist because white women are terrible. And I'm like, but black women been feminists though, baby. Like black women have been fighting against the patriarchy too. And I'm big on like, we are leaving ancestral resources behind when we keep on disrespecting our history and saying that these things are not a part of us. We need our folks, our, we, this battle against white supremacy is spiritual among other things. And we need some spiritual fortitude and we need some folks fighting with us in the spirit realm. Um, and whether you codify that as, you know, ancestral religious practices or Christian, you know, we, because we have so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the way. However, theologically you want to resolve it, or you just want to say, I feel my, you know, the spirit with me, we need that. And when you disrespect the struggle, you know, I think of my grandmama who told me one time, she said the sheriff showed up at her house, you know, just to talk, you know, like in the small town. And she had a gun and he was like, you don't have no license for that gun. And she said, I have this gun. And if you don't get off my property, I will pop a cap in your ass. Really though? But you ain't your ancestors? Because I'm trying to have that level of boldness yes. and bossness yes. that she had, right? We would we if we ever rise to the level of courage that our ancestors had we can't even figure out how to stay in the house three months and we acting like we the first group of black people to live through a pandemic our ancestors survived 1918 with far less resources far less governmental support far less access to information than we have today and we out here three months in talking about i just can't make it i don't know what to do but you better than your ancestors absolutely the fuck not yeah, I, I will say it's so interesting to see people who make a, a big show of rejecting Abrahamic religions and opting for West African religious traditions and respect disrespecting the ancestors doesn't quite make sense to me. Well, 
Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper. I appreciate your time enormously. Thank you for your work. Thank you for always being a voice. Y'all, I am so sorry about the pixelation. I really tried to avoid it. I tried to do tests. I was worried about it because I know that this place that I'm staying at for the time being does not have the lightning fast internet that I need to do my work. It will not happen in the future, but thank y'all for sticking it out. Dr. Cooper was phenomenal phenomenal just such a light be sure to follow her on all social media platforms she is professor underscore crunk leave a comment down below like share and subscribe hit me up on instagram or twitter i am soon going to be debuting a new piece of merch a new merch design it's something that i say and have said before in the past so y'all try to guess it tell me what you think it's gonna be let me know down below in the comments Sign up for the email newsletter. Thank you so much to the patrons and the members. I understand that at this moment, so many people are trying to educate themselves. You wanna know what you should be reading, who you should be listening to. I deeply, deeply want to do that work. Thank you, we can do this together. I appreciate your support enormously. And finally, we're still in a pandemic, you guys. Stay safe, get tested if you can. I know that y'all wanna be out in the streets. I get it, I understand it but please take care of yourselves and please understand that these police are still out here acting crazy. So let's try to be as safe as possible. I will see you next time. Bye.